You know, the mindset stuff is everything, and most people don't have the skin or the mindset to pursue their dreams that they think they are after. You gotta at some point you gotta uh, you gotta jump. Hey guys and gals, we're gonna dive into this call with our guest Brian Evans on this call, and uh, I'm really excited because we get a lot of questions from newer investors. And of course, one of the biggest problems or biggest hurdles that you have when you're starting anything new, it doesn't matter what it is, you could be painting, it could be real estate investing, whatever, it's always getting past the first hurdle. It's getting past the first hurdle and getting that first success under your belt. And real estate is no different. It's, it's you get that first deal done, you check, cash the first check, you help your first seller, you connect with the first buyer, whatever it is, it kind of, you get over that hump. And then a lot of that unsure feeling in your body and a lot of that, you know, that angst goes away or at least it lessens. And we want to focus today's call really on you if you are a newer investor or if you haven't done a deal at all and you're wanting to, to, to dive in and figure out how to, how to start being a real estate investor. I'm also going to take a leap and say, let's say you've already done a deal or two, but you might think that those are a fluke. And you go, okay, well, shoot, I did a couple of deals, but I'm not sure if it was a fluke. I want to make it <laughs> consistent. Um, we want to, and we're going to talk with Brian about that here in a bit. But uh, Brian's background, he's been an investor for a long time. We're, we're going to dive in on, uh, with his, uh, on his backstory and figure out how he got started, how he, how he did his first deal and walk you through what you guys can do. And uh, also, I, I always love looking at people's offices and their work environment. And it's so cool, man. <laughs> it's like talking with like a lots of different people that we interview all the way from uh, two brothers in California. They're in, you know, in this, in this uh, office of one type and a, and a techie guy who's got his comic books all over in the background and stuff. Man, so for those of, of, of the people watching the video version of this, if you're listening to this on the, on the um, iTunes podcast, head over to our website at carrotcast.com. That'll forward you to our uh, spot on the Carrot website for CarrotCast. Brian, first off, welcome on the call. But next, next of all, what's behind you? Like, what, what, you. Is, what are the, the plaques and things like that behind you? Well, this is where the magic happens, right? So this, <laughs> this, is, this is my office away from home. Yeah. Um, I got a great office, a great team, and, and I come into the office literally three days a week. So I work in my business buying and selling properties, talking to sellers, doing deals Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm -hmm. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I, I spend more time with my partner clients where I actually split deal partner uh, deals with, with our clients and split profits 50-50. But behind me is um, uh, basically my little wall of cool things. Um, mm -hmm. We're rated A plus with the Better Business Bureau. I've written three books, so there they are up there. Uh, two of them are bestsellers. Um, uh, I got a Google uh, Partner rating up there, and, and a whole bunch of other cool things. So, to me, I mean, those are just some of my cool, nifty little award things that yeah. I hung up. There's nothing special. <laughs> it's <laughs> <No>. just me, <laughs> dude. It's 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 funny. I was talking with Dan on a previous Carrot Cast. He's he's a techie guy, a paperclip guy, and and like I said, he surrounded himself with with things that kind of inspired him on the creative side of it. For me, um, for people watching the video version of this, once again, I've got our core values on the wall and posters like this that kind of remind me that life is short and things like that. So it's always mm -hmm. awesome just seeing what gets people in the mindset to do great things that sure. they do every day. So I love it, man. And actually, let me show you before, before, yeah. um, before we jump, I want to show you the other side of my wall, uh -huh. which, is, which is what I call my money board. Oh, there so we this, go. Is, this is my office. That's our little sitting area. Uh -huh. um, and then this is this is what I call my money board. I don't know how well you can see it, yeah. but over here we've got possible deals to buy, uh, properties under contract, deals that are currently in rehab repair, properties that are actively for sale or actively for lease option, uh, under contract to sell that should be closing soon, under contract for lease option. So we got a lot going on, so I call that my money board. And the way we do it is our deal flow just really goes like this. It goes from left to right, just like you're reading a book, and it's about finding you know, is it a possible seller? Then is it under contract? Then once you've bought it, what are you doing to it to make it active for sale? Mm -hmm. uh, then once it's active for sale, you get it under contract to sell, and this is where the green stuff comes in over here, uh, which is called money, and then it just kind of repeats itself. So that's my money board. That's how I keep track of, track of things here in my business, very granular, and the other two people in my office, Kalisa and Mary, uh, they help me keep track of all the, the nuts and bolts of it all. I love it, man. So we're we're gonna dive into that here in a little bit later for sure, because I've got some questions for you. But I want to cool. start at the at, at, at the start. Um, so you're obviously doing deals, and we saw the money board had a lot of action going on in there. Where did you start? Wait, what what got you into real estate in the first place? What was your life like before real yeah. estate? Did you have another job? Kind of where did you start, man? Um, before I got into real estate, I was 
I graduated from college with a degree in economics, and I found a job on Wall Street working for an insurance company up in up in New York. And I was taking a train and a bus and a and walking an hour and a half door to door to get to work to my job on Wall Street. I was working in the Trump Building, 40 Wall Street. Um, so for any of you Trump lovers or haters out there, <laughs> there you go. Um, but uh, so I came home from work one day and my dad and there was a package at my front doorstep and inside that package was a book and in that book in, in that package was a book with a post-it note and the post-it note was from my father. It said, "Son, read this. Take notes. Let's talk, Dad." Huh. So my dad's a corporate guy, you know, all business. So of course I read the book, uh, to, went went through it and read it that week on the on the commutes. And it really changed my life and my way of thinking. It was uh, it talked to me about if you're going to work so hard, why not try to find a way to retire early versus working your way up the corporate ladder like everybody else? And um, you know, going to business for yourself. It talked about stocks. It talked about opening a company. It talked about real estate and all the other stuff. So for me, it was like, man, I was never I was never taught this before. I I'm here doing a job a nine to five, and I I didn't realize there was so much more out there to really consider and to shoot for, to go for, versus the corporate ladder thing. So that got me into, into the, the excitement of real estate. And then about a couple months later, I ended up quitting that job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to go through another entrepreneurial venture with some other high school friends at the time, we started a coffee shop. We were going to take on Starbucks. We apparently knew how to make a better latte, for whatever reason that was. <laughs> and long story short, that failed pretty miserably. We had a lot of personally guaranteed debt. Don't ever personally guarantee debt unless it's your own home, in my opinion. Um, and so that failed. So when that failed, I really was at a crossroads. Do I go back and do I go back to a job and look in the papers, which I did, or do I try this real estate thing, which is what I wanted to originally do from the beginning? I decided to try this real estate thing. And the way I found, the way I got into it was I was networking with some friends and I was, was asking around. I said, hey, do you know of anybody that invests in real estate? For, for a living. And a friend of mine said, yes, I do. So I met these two guys. They were brothers up in Louisville, Kentucky. I live in Lexington, so about an hour or so away from me. And long, and long story short, I, I, I basically forced them to hire me as an apprentice for free. Mm-hmm. They uh, agreed. It was a great relationship. I was working for them for free. They were making a lot of money, and I'm learning the business. And they're doing deals. They're negotiating short sales. They're doing all that stuff. This is back in 2004, 2005-ish. And from then on out, I closed my first deal with them. I found this deal for them, and I negotiated everything and did everything. And I said, you know what, guys? I've been working with you all for free for like six months. And frankly, I'm hurting. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I'm hungry. And I said, hey, I did this deal from beginning to end. Can we work out a profit share? And they agreed. We worked out a profit share, and I bought this thing so well that I walked away with a check for over forty-two thousand dollars. What? And that nice. was my first deal. Nice. And it changed my life forever. And I thought to myself, my gosh, if I can do this with the little experience I have, imagine what I could do if I really tried to do this full time for my own business, my own self. And I never looked back since. We parted ways amicably. It was fine. But it was time for me, you know, I blossomed, right? So I've got my butterfly wings, now it's time to fly. Uh, It was a scary time, but uh, I'm uh, extremely happy for all the ups and downs that I went through because it made me stronger and made me better today. So to this very day, I still invest in real estate every day full time. I'm in the trenches all the time. We've done hundreds of deals. I don't even know anymore. You know, some people say they've done 15,000 deals and things like that. I don't know how you keep track. You just, you've done a lot of deals. I've talked to thousands of sellers. And I'm in the trenches every day. We're buying and selling, buying and holding, and I just love what I do, and it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Man, I, I love it. And I want to kind of unpack one part of what you mentioned there. So to get your start, you found some mentors, and you went and worked for them for free. So there's there's in the investors I talk with, there's a lot of mindset blocks that will get in people's, get in people's way, right? They'll be going, okay, I, I'm not sure what I need to learn. I, I'm not sure who I need to connect with. Or they'll go out there and, and, and try to get a paid job, and they're trying to force that through. Um, kind of what in your mind made it click that said, okay, I'm not going to go out there and try to get a job, even though all my friends, family are probably saying I'm crazy. I'm going to go work for these guys for free. What was <laughs> that that pushed you in that direction versus the, the alternate route? Um, well, I had nothing to lose mm-hmm. and everything to gain. Um, I had no money, very little money, very little credit. And I wasn't married yet, no kids, no real risk. If it didn't work, so what? 
it was just kind of the thing where if there was ever a time to do it, this was the time. Mm-hmm. And had it had my life been different, had I had children been married, had more responsibilities, I probably wouldn't have done it. But because I already had left the corporate world and got into the entrepreneurial world, it's not as scary as you may think. Is it hard? Damn right it is. It's supposed to be hard. Harder than probably you could ever imagine. Mm-hmm. But because I already took that leap, it wasn't it, it wasn't too hard to stay in there and focus on something that I just felt in my gut and in my heart was the right thing to try. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's I don't know if that's the right answer, but it was just it was kind of happenstance, fate, whatever you call it. It just it just drew me to it, and I love real estate. Real estate is it's incredible. It's incredible. And you, you mentioned that when you hard. do it right, exactly, when, man. When you do it right, dude. And, and you mentioned being an entrepreneur's heart. So what are some of those instances that pop in your head? There's some of those. Some of those hard times as an entrepreneur that kind of defined who you are now. Well, you know, shit happens. We we just bought a commercial building mm-hmm. uh, about a month or two ago, and we're renovating it as we speak. So yesterday morning, I wake up to a phone call, and there's two inches of water in our first floor. So what had happened is it was burglarized. Mm-hmm. So we're almost done renovating this commercial building, which I bought for a steal, um, and it's but. Uh, you know the seller. I didn't stick a gun to the seller's head or anything. So let's. It's not a bad thing to do, to buy a property correctly. Yeah. But we're putting about a hundred grand into this thing, and we're almost done. Somebody went in, burglarized, cut out the p- copper pipes and stuff, and oh, water gosh. there. So they probably made a couple hundred bucks, if that. And we're in the hole for a couple thousand bucks. So that hurt. And it's it's one of those things. It's called life. Mm-hmm. Life's a four letter word, but that can be taken good and bad because. Another four-letter word is love, you know. So there's a lot of great things out there, but life is hard, and going into business for yourself is hard. There is no fallback. There's no safety net, and um, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of following your gut, and it's a lot of taking action. It's a lot of learning and continuing education. It's a lot of relationships, and it's a lot of really trying to enjoy what you do and improve upon your business and yourself every day. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, listen, if you do your best at the end of the day, I'm a big believer that God will take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. So you just got to get out there and do your best. And if you can't go to bed every night saying I did my best, then you're doing something wrong. And if you don't really love what you do and even love the downs, because when you when you overcome those down periods, it makes it more exciting. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've got a funny question here for you. You've probably never been asked this question in an interview ever, but I've got a reason for it. I've got a re- it just now popped in my head. So um, is is your is your closet clean and tidy? And it's the weirdest question ever, but I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it matters. Like, is is your closet clean and tidy, or is it messy? It's messy. Yeah. So, so here here's the reason I ask. Not um, terribly messy, but it's <laughs> it's not clean. I mean, it's I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, dude. Here's here's the reason I All ask. Because right. um, right, I uh, this is probably three years ago. I went through my own little transformation, and and um and and part of my issue was, man, I was just. I, 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 I was not doing my best in the little things in life. And there were little things like that where my dresser, my closet, you know, washing the dish and putting it on the, on the counter, that kind of stuff. And sure, sure. and for me, it, it, it switched <laughs> as soon as I started focusing on the little things like that. Sure. The rest of my life, the rest of my business got easier. And sure. um, I'm always curious about high, high performing people like yourself and going, okay, what is it that works for you? Because what works for me doesn't work for everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and... What do you find with so many things going on, so many deals going on? You've got multiple businesses, you have a family, you have kids. Kind of, do you feel like you get pulled in multiple directions? And how do you deal with that? How do you clear that mind? How do you clear the clutter? Absolutely. I mean, we're going through that right now. We're doing a, we're preparing for a boot camp here in August, and mm-hmm. just bought this commercial building that we're renovating, moving into, and and also renting out. We've got three deals right now. We're getting ready to close in the next two weeks. Um, we're buying properties, renovating. I got my vice president. She's on vacation. She went on a mission trip last week. She's on vacation this week. Uh, so, f- like for three weeks, she was here, gone for a week, here for a week, gone for a week. And I said, "This is never going to happen again." <laughs> but yeah, it. You know what? It's supposed to be hard, Trevor. You know that. Yeah. And it's it's just supposed to be. Now that doesn't mean it has to be painful all the time, mm-hmm. but it's supposed to be hard. So that's okay. Yep. And I actually kind of enjoy the thrill of the hardness of it. Because, again, when you overcome that problem or that obstacle, as much as it hurts and is painful at the time, when you overcome it, it makes you so much stronger. You faced your fear. I'm a huge believer that if something scares me, I need to do it and want to do it 
just because it, it, I'm, t- I'm, I'm intimidated by it or fearful of whatever could possibly happen or not happen. So yeah. facing your fear is huge. And it, it, all this is cliche to a degree, but it's extremely important. You know, the mindset stuff is everything. And most people don't have the skin or the mindset to pursue their dreams that they think they are after. You got to at some point, you got to uh, you got to jump, mm-hmm. to jump. Man, so studying a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of high performers, I always, I always love to see the difference between the people who make it and the people who don't. And you coach a lot of people. You help a lot of people get the first deal done. Uh, what, what have you seen that is one of those key differences that is the people who succeed versus the ones who don't? Well, I would say, first of all, most of the people that succeed statistically in my business are female. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> so, so for whatever that means to people, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but women seem to just get off their butt and take action and not worry so much about this with me. I don't know why. Um, but um, if you think too much, you're going to think yourself right out of it and you're going to get scared. you got, you got to take action. You have to be willing to ask uncomfortable questions. But there's ways to do it. You just have to face your fear and take action and go mm-hmm. and and follow the advice of hopefully your mentor, whoever that is, and hopefully that they know what they're doing and can lead you down the right path based on their current real life experiences uh, in addition to whatever they did up till then. So, yeah. Man, are, are there anything specifically that when you're working with someone who's looking to get that first deal done that you help them face their fear? Like, do you walk them through any, if, if someone's, if someone's not doing what you ask and you, and you, and you drill it down to fear, what do you, yeah. what do you do for that person? What do you do to get them? Past I'll be that? honest. I try to stay patient in the no. beginning, but I'm a very impatient person. So if it gets to a point where it's groundhog day over and over, at some point you start to get a little frustrated by them. And sometimes you raise your voice a little bit. Um, get your ass out there and just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you so worried about? You know, some people are worried about what their family and friends think. Um, it's not even so much if they will succeed. And I think I know why. Because most, and I'm not, I don't want to bash other trainers or gurus, but there's a lot of bad people out there. Mm-hmm. People that you might think are good people that actually do. There's a lot of people that don't do what they say or what they teach. And that's yeah. just the truth. And you can probably relate 100%. Oh, yeah. So I don't want to bash anybody or name call, but most all trainers teach the same thing, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to finding motivated leads. What I love about you and with Carrot is it's an online world and we are absolutely transforming to that online world and online has been huge for me in my business because when somebody searches for something online which is what most people do these days and your website or your company comes up there's a lot more credibility than you going out and cold calling or mailing letters or things like that to that person they they found they're looking and searching and found you mm-hmm. versus you hunting and searching for them um, putting out signs on telephone poles, FISBO cold calling, things like that. I'm a big marketing guy. I, those things make you almost feel cheap and sleazy mm-hmm. and dirty. I used to do them, yeah. but I was never in control of my business. So now we do things. I don't know if you want to jump into this now or not. Yeah, dude, but take, take way, it where you want to go. Yeah. The, way, the, the number one hardest thing for people to do if they're brand new, aside from closing their first deal, is how do you find these motivated sellers and consistently? Mm-hmm. Well, the way you do it is you have to stop doing the things that don't work, the cheap and sleazy marketing is what I call it. You're basically spamming your market. Well, you have to be professional and credible. So yeah. what I mean by that is you have to be willing to invest a little bit of money into your marketing. And you can, so that way you can determine a return on your investment. So for me, the four big things that we do in my business to find motivated sellers is number one, we run television commercials, TV commercials. We're on the TV all the time. 15 second spots, 30 second spots, you don't need much more than that. We run our commercials around the news time, things like that, because if, if it's not around the news time, if it's run an old, ep- old episode of Friends, people DVR those things. But they don't DVR the news, they watch it live. Yeah. So um, news, we're running TV commercials, radio commercials work great. Do a lot of radio commercials. Uh, we do direct mail and then online marketing. So when somebody goes to Google and types in sell my house or buy my house or we buy houses, guess whose ad pops up? Mm-hmm. Ours. So you don't understand the power of that. And then being rated with the, with the Better Business Bureau, doing the things that create credibility and authority versus the things that make you feel dirty and, and cheap. And that's why people don't want to tell their friends and family what they do is because they don't want to tell people they're running around putting out signs in the middle of the night. Yep, exactly. So uh, that's just my opinion. Take it as you will, but I'm a big believer in doing things the right way. 
Man, so on, on the credibility side of it, um, I was on an amazing podcast called Another Caracast Call last week that will be, it was either published by the time you guys listen to this or after this one with a guy named Martin. And Martin's in Phoenix, and he's going in, into, into many deals offering way lower than the competition, but getting the deal because of the credibility. And you mentioned the Better Business Bureau. Um, what other kinds of things can, especially, let's, dude, let's, let's just say a newer investor. Let's say someone's going, okay, I've never done a deal. What do I? What can I do to be credible? What do you? What do you guys suggest? First and foremost, be honest. Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell a seller your weaknesses, but you also don't have to tell them that you've never done a deal. Yep. So it's not. I don't think it's. It's not faking it till you make it. But you don't certainly don't need to disclose to somebody that you've never done a deal before and you just read a book and you're starting to do real estate now. Mm -hmm. You know, for thirty days. But at the same token, you got to be honest. So the first thing, the hardest thing to do is to find motivated sellers. Well, that's actually easy. It's called writing a check, not being afraid to invest money in your marketing. But the marketing must be able to convert. So, and then you must be able to track it online. Uh, you know, track. So if you spend a thousand dollars on this, did that a thousand dollars make you or lose you money? And it's simple common sense math. So anybody I work with, I tell people you have to be be willing to invest at least five hundred dollars a month, minimum, minimum. Yeah. And that's a super small budget, but you got to start somewhere. Um, and then the second hardest thing to teach people is when you do find these motivated sellers, what do you say? How do you talk to them? How do you make offers? Mm -hmm. And that's really not that hard either because it's a relationship business. It's a person-to-person -person business, and it's, and it's simply saying, hey, Mr. Seller, so tell me a little bit about your house and what you're looking to do here. That's, I start that with every conversation. Tell me a little bit about your house and what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. And most of them will jump right into it, and I'll have to jump in and, and, and kind of clarify what I'm looking for, but it helps get them talking. And um, uh, and then I'll say the first thing I'll say is you know for you know I'm not in the, I'm not looking to buy your house to live in it I'm an investor and I have to find a way to make a profit otherwise there's no no way for I can me to buy your house and they completely understand that if you say that to a seller it's amazing what happens yeah. and if you go into each conversation with the absolute purpose of helping this person whether you buy it or if you realize you can't buy it helping them. Uh, to get their problem solved, the whole world, the whole business changes. So uh, I'll say to these people, I say, listen, I don't think I'm going to be your buyer because you're asking too much. I'd love to buy it, but I don't think I can because the only way you'll ever get top dollar is if that person that's going to buy it is going to live in it. You know, you know, you called me, I'm an investor, so I can't live in it. And most people you'll talk to are not going to be people you can buy from. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be willing to get through those as quickly and professionally as you can help them solve their problem and then continue to do those that lead generation to you find those golden nuggets and they are more than enough out there but you got to go through the people that can't that you can't buy versus the ones you can so people either need to sell or want to sell the people that want to sell you can't buy because they want too much mm -hmm. the people that need to sell need to sell meaning they need to sell because of whatever reason in their life they're moving they got divorced they just inherited a property a death whatever so they need to sell quickly they need cash they're willing to give up equity or they need debt relief um, so that's pretty much how it works. And then the other cool thing is on all the properties we don't buy, we have a system in place, Trevor, where we refer those deals, we refer those sellers who we've already built a relationship with to other realtors mm -hmm. and we get paid a referral fee between 250 to $500 per, uh, per, per lead, we per referral. Hmm. So there's ways to monetize this business even if you don't buy these homes. Yeah. So when you have these systems in place and if we have a good relationship with that seller and have good follow-ups, it's incredible what you really can do versus just the one-off deals. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers guy, so a couple things piqued my interest there. So first of all, on the agent side with those referrals, are those, uh, do, do you get that referral fee if they close on a sale with them? Or if, they, you, if they list. If they list, okay, cool. If they so list with the realtor. Okay, yep. that's really cool and that's really important, guys and guys. So write that one down because a lot of people will come to us and they're looking at working with agents and they just get a share of the commission if they if they have a real estate license too. So that's a good one. The second one was, because um, I know newer investors are going to be thinking about this and they might be talking to 20 sellers or whatever and not get a deal. Now you're an expert in, in, in negotiation and just and just being able to relate to people. You've, you've done, like you said, talk to thousands of sellers. How many uh, sellers do you have to talk to currently where you are in your business to close a deal? Probably... We're probably I'm probably buying maybe one out of ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the other seven we probably can't buy for sure. The other two or three are possibles. Mm -hmm. And the and so just like my money board over here, the possibles. 
in my business, when a seller lead comes in, they're either a yes, a no, a possible, or a referral. Mm -hmm. If they're a yes, it means that we got them under contract, right? It's, it's signed, it's inked, it's a yes. If it's a no, it means I wasn't interested based on their numbers or they weren't interested based on my offer, mm -hmm. okay? If it's a possible, it means yes, there's a possibility. I think we're both good. We met face to face. Now I need to see the house. No contract is signed yet, but we both think that we want to do business together. Okay. And then if it's a referral, a referral can be a no uh, that we refer off or a possible that turns into a no that then we refer off. So that's how we categorize them in our business. And for each one of those yes, no, possible or referrals, we have a follow up system to make sure that we can convert that possible to a yes or that no to a possible, mm -hmm. or that or that no to a referral, right? So we literally have a flow chart of everything that, that funnels everything in. So just like a lot of internet marketing people think about those stuff, we've created those same processes and systems in our business, um, all, 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 both, both online with emails and offline with, with physical letters. What, what are you guys using systems-wise for your follow-up? Uh, I have a, a my personal CRM system that I have, create and customizes for us. I didn't build it and write it. I'm not yeah, that yeah. smart. I'm not <laughs> smart. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a software system. It's a CRM system. It's called My Client Dashboard, okay. and we use it for all of our deals. Cool. I love and, it, man. Yeah. I love it. So I, I want to kind of shift a little bit of the focus to that, to your, your deal board or your money board. Yeah. Because um, it was interesting. I, I did another carrot cast with a, a client of ours um, in, uh, up, up in Ohio somewhere. But anyway, he had a, a board that was very similar. And I think it's always fascinating seeing how people arrange their business. Um, mm -hmm. Some people keep everything just online and they're kind of going on with the, the whole podio craze and stuff. I mm -hmm. think, I think honestly the podio craze is starting to kind of wear off now. People are bailing from podio and going to other systems too, because it's just too big of a can of worms. But, um, so on, on that deal board, you guys get the leads online through your CRM that you guys custom built that you guys, I'm assuming your coaching students and stuff like that have access to it somehow. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. So uh, leads come into us either through phone call mm -hmm. or through online submission. Okay. Or through email. And then how do they so, get on the deal board? So when they get on the so when they come into our office, the very first thing is whether it's an email or a phone call, my my executive assistant Mary, she will contact that person directly. Okay. There will be a one on one communication. And she will contact them and get some details about that person and about their home, what they're asking for the house what they think it would appraise for, if we had it appraise, does it need any repairs, what's the address, what's their phone number, all that kind of stuff. Is there a mortgage on it? If so, tell me about it. Most people give this information because of how they found us through TV or BBB, other things, right? So I'll, when they come into my office, uh, well, let me back up. So she'll, she'll cover that information, get all that, then what she will do is she, then she will immediately schedule a phone call or an office visit for me and that seller. Mm -hmm. So I, unless it's an absolute no based on the criteria I've given her about certain deals or seller leads, she will, sketch, she will set up a private one-on-one -on -one call for me to talk to this person where I will call at a specific day and time. Or even more preferred than that is that seller will come to my office. We'll have a one-on-one -on -one sit down face-to-face -face in my conference room. Those are the more motivated sellers. Um, from there, basically what we do is, is to, now it's, okay, once I've spoken to them, are they a yes, no, possible, or referral? Mm -hmm. And then if basically the whole thing is to get everybody to become a yes, if they're a yes, they're under contract. Now we do the title thing. We have to make sure we've seen the house and do our due diligence before closing. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? No, dude, that's Fine. perfect. I was trying to get the, the whole flow of how it goes, and that's great. Yeah. Because um, I'm kind of the same way where we have a lot of online tools for Carrot and for you know, my, my company where I own rental properties. But I've got to have visuals here. Like I've got to walk into the office and have it yeah. there. It's just the way that I am. So yeah. that's something I suggest to everyone listening to this podcast is kind of figure out how you love to absorb information, how you love to look at things. And even yeah, if you're I, using technology, surround yourself in your office with the things you need. Absolutely. Like Kalisa and Mary in my office, you know, this is their money board. Mm -hmm. So they've got everything laid out and they keep it digitally and, and Excel spreadsheets kind of stuff. And so as they're going through in all of our new leads that come in, as they're going through this stuff on theirs, I'm looking at it on mine. We're meeting in my office over here and we're going through it. Okay. And we're going through from left to right as far as our deals, our new deals, um, our follow up processes and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very organized, very systemized. That's cool. So a couple more questions for you, because like, like I said, I, I always love um, helping someone get their first success. I know that's what you focus on um, 
mainly. I mean, it sounds like you, you coach a lot of people into getting their first deal, which is the reason I wanted to have you on this call. Because we tend to, man, one of my faults at Carrot is we, we, we talk to a very, very specific type of client, ideally someone who's already doing deals, you know, uh, things like that. So oftentimes our content will be at a pretty darn high level on the lead gen side. We're actually going to be um, kind of stepping back a little bit this summer and putting out a lot of kind of starter content um, mm -hmm. because we realize there's a lot of people that need help there and you're one of the best at it. So what I guess, first of all, I know you mentioned you guys have a boot camp um, in August and this podcast should uh, be published originally before that. If you guys are listening to this after that, you know, it doesn't matter. There's probably something that you can connect with Brian on. But what, what kind of experience do you walk people through that you found that helps them succeed the most uh, with your boot camps, with your coaching, things like that? The biggest thing that all people need to have in order to be successful is confidence. Mm -hmm. Confidence and belief in their self. If you don't have confidence, you're going to struggle greatly. Because when you have confidence, you encounter a hurdle and you figure out how to jump over it, climb under it, go around it, or break through it. But if you don't have the confidence to try any of those things, you're very likely to fail. So you need, people need to work on their confidence. And, and how we help our clients work on their confidence is really just shooting straight with them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people, I don't care how old or young you are, they just need a swift kick in the ass. <laughs> they, need, they, need, they just need to be um, led, yeah. probably is a better term. And some people are, you know, can be led better based on their different personalities. But I, I'm just kind of a straight shooter. And uh, I'm not going to call you names, but come on, if we're going to do this, let's do this. And I got your back kind of a thing. So confidence is key. So when I, the, the, one of the main things I love to do with my new partners is before we, before we move forward, they have to come to me um, and they see my office. I want them to see our business and actually see how we're doing deals and sit in or listen in on phone calls where I'm talking to sellers or meeting with sellers or go out on a house appointment where we get that property under contract. See, feel it, touch it, smell it what we do every day mm -hmm. when people come here and they see that it's not rocket science we don't we're not in a high-rise office building and we still do extremely extremely well they realize that it's really not that scary after all you know it's four walls a roof a whiteboard a couple computers and some phones mm -hmm. that's it it's it's not that complicated so don't make it scarier than it really truly is and it's again solving someone's problem which they need to sell you want to buy so let's have an honest conversation to see if we can find a way to to make the numbers work. And I, another thing I say is, listen, Mr. Seller, I know you want to sell it for as much as you possibly can. And you know I want to buy it for as little as I possibly can, and that's okay. <laughs> the goal of this conversation is to really see if there is a happy medium. And if not, there's no harm, no foul. If I can help you, I will. Yep. But I say those things so that way, because most people try to beat around the bush, just go for it, and it'll make your life easier, it'll make it more fun, people will appreciate your honesty more, and you'll be more successful. Man, I, I, I heard a quote that I heard it from a buddy of mine actually about a year ago. It sticks with me all the time. <laughs> and he heard it from someone else. And uh, everyone's got a skeletons in their closet, right? So whether it's per, uh, you're, uh, as a person, a business. And I'm not talking bad stuff you did, but every product or service has things that the market could be perceived as a weakness, right? Sure. So I'm not saying sure. it's a, you robbed a bank or anything like that. Sure. But... Um, he said what a lot of people will do is they'll try to hide the skeleton. So in, in, in that case, it's okay. The obvious is that I'm going to be offering a low offer and they'll right. hide that in right. hopes that the seller doesn't think about it. Right. But the problem is when, when your prospect finds it and discovers it, they, they found, they feel like that they discovered something and it's a, it's a right. nick in your armor. Right. So you take that skeleton out of the closet and make it dance. You use it in your benefit, just like you did there. So are there other things when you're talking with sellers, talking with buyers, like you said, you're a straight shooter where you're literally taking those, what some people perceive as a weakness, taking that skeleton out and making it dance. Sure. I yeah. I mean, it, really what you say or don't say and everything in this business is, is, is huge. Mm -hmm. I'll say this. So they'll say, well, why don't you make me an offer? I say, with all due respect, I can't make you an offer because I haven't seen your house. Mm -hmm. So I can determine approximately what I think I could buy your house for based on what you're telling me. But I don't want to drive all the way out there and spend time if you and I are not close on numbers right away. You've told me that you want 140 for it, and you've told me it's worth 150. So with all due respect to me, even to make you an offer, it would be offensive to you when you've told me that you won't, won't go lower than 140. Mm -hmm. Right. So and, it, and when you say that that way and you explain to them the reason why, it makes sense. Yep. So um, you just have to be honest, and you have to really figure out your style for talking on the phone because this thing right here. 
will make you so much money if you know how to do it correctly and have a real conversation with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that's it's just the truth. Dude, I, I, I could talk this this uh, psychology and negotiation <laughs> stuff all day long. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, man, an, another thing that popped in my head there. So let's say you you, know, you guys are, um, are, are working on a price. You got a price nailed down or mm-hmm. close to it. You find something that pops up in the middle of the transaction. You've got to go back to the seller and negotiate again. Have you had any, have you had any instances like that where it's kind of blown up or kind of what do you do there? Yeah, many times. It happens frequently. Um, not, not too, too frequently, but it actually can be a, a good thing. Mm-hmm. I'll give you two examples. The first one's really cool. The second one's not very cool. Um, the first one, I went out and, and agreed to buy this person's house for um, 40000 Went out there. This house fixed up is probably worth about one hundred and fifteen. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe one hundred and twenty. Fixed up. Bought it for forty because this thing was just dirty, wrong, vacant. You know, it was just ugly. Um, but after cleaned up and you do some things, once you know how to do it, you realize how to fix these things and, and make money. I told her I'm gonna. I'll put this under contract with you today for forty thousand. But I, every property I buy, I get an inspection. Some investors, it's as is, no inspection. Not me. I get inspections on every single property, and I get inspections done quick. So my inspector will go out there, and uh, whether I buy the house or not, I pay him. It doesn't matter. The same amount is usually about three, three fifty. Depends on the size of the home. So in this one example in particular, it came back that this home needed more work than I saw with my eyes. Mm-hmm. Because I, I'm not going to go out crawling under crawl spaces and jumping on roofs and things like that. My job is to find these properties and get them under contract. Mm-hmm. And I'll let the system make sure that I don't mess up. So in this one, this, this house f- turned out had some foundation issues and some other things. So I called the seller and I said, Mrs. Seller, I said, um, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is I still want to buy your house. The bad news is after the inspection, my offer is going to have to change dramatically. Hmm. And she says, and I explained to her what we found and things like that. So she says, well, what, 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 what can you buy it for? What can you give me? I said, I said, I'll give you, I can't remember if it was 20 or something. I said, I'll give you 20,000. So I'd literally cut my offer in half, hmm. which probably was too much. But I, but I did it anyway. So she immediately came back from 40. She said, will you take 25? Hmm. Just like that. Because I was honest and I explained to her what I found. Yeah. I said, you can have the appraisal or the inspection rather if you want to see it. I have nothing to hide. Hmm. I do want to buy it, but I just can't, I can't make money based on these numbers. And I, and I explained to these people what my numbers are. I said, it's going to cost me a couple thousand bucks to buy your home. It's going to cost me a couple thousand bucks to hold your home for however long I have to hold it until I get it resold if it's a flip. It's going to cost me money to repair it. Roof, AC, everything else, it's going to cost me 25 grand to get your home fixed up. Then when I sell this house, I'm not a realtor, so I don't get a special break. I'm not special. i got to pay a realtor fee because the only way to find the highest, pers- the highest person that will pay for your house is to list it with a realtor. It's yeah. life. So you got to list it with a realtor to find that top end buyer. And then the other cost I have is it costs me money to borrow money, right? And after all those five big costs, I still haven't made a profit. Mm-hmm. I have staff, I have some overhead, and I got a wife that loves to shop. <laughs> so I got to make a profit. And I, so I say these things. When you explain how those numbers work, people get it. Yep. And they're willing to come down a lot more on their numbers because they now understand that I'm not stealing their house. I'm actually losing money if I did give them that number, okay? So that was the first example. Went back and got an inspection and got it for $20,000. So no, what happened was she said 25. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm a big fan of Michael Jordan. I'll give you 23. Mm-hmm. She agreed. We, we, we signed, got her cash the next couple days later, and then we closed. Cool. So inspections can work to your benefit. Um, so don't ever not get an inspection because they, you could make more money by what they find, or you can save money by not getting yourself into a, situa- a problem situation that you weren't aware of. And I've done that too, both ways. So now we do inspections on everything. The other one was very simple. I went out and saw this guy's house. Great guy, nice guy. I thought this home was worth a lot more than it was. Um, come to find out, it's, it wasn't. So before closing, I simply said, listen, you're not going to like And I said the same thing. I've got good news and bad news is kind of how I say it. I still want to buy your house, but I can't buy it for what we agreed upon. And I feel terrible. And I told him I feel, I feel terrible. I really do. Because I know you wanted to sell it and I wanted to buy it. But you and I both thought that your home was worth more. And um, it's just not. And I thought it was. So this is a property I had under contract, had an agreement to sign, gave him a deposit, um, $10, mm-hmm. $10 good faith deposit. And it's funny. The funny thing is, Trevor, on this one, I felt really bad for this guy because he was hurting. 
And we had greased the price. So as I was leaving, I said, I'd say, he's like, I don't even have enough money to buy groceries. I said, listen, here's a $100 bill. Go buy you some groceries. Mm -hmm. So I, I really felt sometimes you connect with these people. Yeah. So I felt terrible. But I cannot let his problem become my problem. If I would have bought that, I would have lost money. Yeah. Or or very or possibly broken even or maybe made a little bit, but not enough to go through that risk. Um, so you just have to be honest. And it's amazing, even when you don't follow through with something, if you're honest with people, they will accept it. And it's very easy to write a write a write a letter and mail it to them and be a genuine human being when you're working with these people. So doing those extra steps can make them change their mind and see your side if things change on their end, or hopefully not burn a bridge. Man, we, we talked about credibility earlier, and just this last five minutes or so of this podcast, yeah. we, didn't, we didn't lead into this with the, with the structure of credibility, with what you were saying there, but that right there is massive credibility builder for someone when they're talking with someone. Like, like you said, they're being transparent. They're, they're like almost taking the curtain and showing you behind the curtain. They're saying, yeah. here's my exact numbers, here's what yeah. I'm going with, there's nothing being hidden, yep. um, and it builds massive credibility. So if there's newer investors listening to this, and you're looking to get that first deal done, and you're like, man, how do I have credibility as not uh, not having a deal done? Just yep. be transparent and honest and be a real person like Brian's saying. I love it. Yeah, I yeah. Love it, be 100% hundred, be hundred real. And sometimes I'll say to the seller, I'll say, well, how much do you, money do you think I should make on a deal mm -hmm. or a house like this? And they'll, they'll tell me. And, and sometimes, usually people will say, I don't know, 10, 15,000. I say, you're right. Actually, my goal is 20. But if I bought your house, I would have lost money because I go through those numbers. So I'll, I'll really kind of relay the conversation to get them thinking about why my offer is what it is and that I'm not some bad guy looking to steal houses and put people on the street. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the exact opposite, actually. I love it, man. Well, dude, this has been an insanely great uh, podcast. And one of the cool things about it is coming in here, you know, I thought we were going to talk about one part, but I loved how the conversation went and talked about negotiation, how to talk with sellers. Um, how, how to deal with issues that pop up like that, you know, if yeah. something comes up in inspection. And I think people just really love hearing how to speak with someone. And yeah. some, man, you had some amazing golden nuggets there. Um, is there, I guess, where, where can people contact? Where can people learn more from you and things like that? Sure. Yeah, my company is called The First Deal. Uh, we're the only company in the world that focuses on, on helping new customers or new investors close their first deal or their first 100 deals. Mm -hmm. So that's our slogan. We'll help you close your first deal or your first 100 deals because at some point after you close your first deal, there's what's next. You want to create your own empire and you can do that. But you got to close your first deal. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to thefirstdeal.com and I've got a free CD called Three Simple Steps to Closing Your First Deal in 30 Days or Less. It's great. A lot of great information there. We have uh, conduct webinars usually two or three times a week, um, and you can go to First Deal Webinar to jump on one of those. Uh, we're having a boot camp in August. Uh, the, you can go to thefirstdealbootcamp.com, and we're also we're creating a schedule to do more of these boot camps, uh, like on a quarterly basis. And I'll tell you real quick. I want to say why. If I'm doing so well closing these deals, why the heck am I here talking to you, talking about other things? Well, here's the truth. It's about money period. It's about making money. And there's nothing wrong with making money for a skill that you've learned and acquired over the years uh, that can help other people make more money. But the real secret is I want to do more deals. So by me teaching and educating and working with people, not only is it fun, and believe it or not, I actually have learned a tremendous amount by teaching other people on improving my own business. So every day I'm learning uh, continuously. But I look for partners, people that are interested in doing deals with me and in exchange for that relationship, we split profits 50-50 on the deals we do together. So for me, the money really is in the deals. And by doing a boot camp or doing certain trainings, whatever the cost or price is, for me, it's more about developing a relationship to work with people that are really going to do deals where we split profits. Really quick example. So let's say I've got a, I'm, I'm the new McDonald's franchise on the block. Nobody's ever heard of me before, but I, I, may, I make awesome burgers. I can't sell those burgers to people in Atlanta or LA or Florida or, Cal or Colorado, right? But what I can do is, is help another business owner open a McDonald's like mine there, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a franchise, but the, the purpose and the, the analogy is the same. So if we can open up a Brian Evans real estate investment company where you live and we split profits for a period of time and work out a business relationship where I'm helping you do deals, get them closed and everything else in between, that's to me what's exciting because mm -hmm. then it's an extenuation of what I'm doing every day that I love 
but uh, but I'm working with other people, and it's it's much harder to try to go out another hour from where you live to do more deals because at some point you you scale yourself too thin. Yep. But if I have a regional manager or a president of that company there doing the same thing wherever that is, then it's not as difficult. Does that make sense? Oh, totally, man. It's it's okay. a way to scale your business up without having to scale your time. So that's that's the that's the hidden thing. So I know you probably want to cut this, but no, dude, you're good. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, with that said, guys and gals, go and implement some of the things that Brian mentioned here. And of course, if you resonate with his message, resonate with, um, you know, just with with him and what he's about. Go uh, go to his website. I was at thefirstdeal.com, right? Yeah, the first deal. The first deal. dot com. And the biggest thing I want you guys to take away from this call is if you are a new investor, if you are um, trying to get your first deal done, if you have gotten a deal or two done, but you're like, ah, oh, man, how do I get the other ones done? You know, really, you got to bust through that that uh, that fear first of all. You just got to get get out there and do it. And uh, second of all, take some of the things that Brian was mentioning in here on the negotiation side of it, because I've talked with so many investors who end up losing money or who end up um, not doing the type of deal that they should be doing just because the words that they're saying on the phone or in person with their sellers. So some yeah. of the stuff that you went over, man, is awesome. I took notes. Cool. And cool. anytime I looked away, I was taking little quick notes because we're going to do timestamps on, on the call. <laughs> we're like, all right, at this point, you guys can learn about X. So awesome cool. stuff. And I really appreciate you coming on this, this call. And dude, if there's anything that, that I can do for you, let me know. And guys and gals, like I said, if you're listening to this, uh, at the time we're releasing this, um, we don't make an affiliate commission, none of that, but connect with Brian. They do have a boot camp coming up. If, if it's something you resonate with, amazing. Connect with him and see if you guys can work together. One last question before we part. Man, what excites you the most about life? Like, what is the legacy that you want to live um, in life? And uh, how, how does your business fuel that? Me? Okay. You, man, you. Um, my family. Yeah. I got, two, I got two boys. And nothing... In my my wife, um, you know, there's just the four of us leaving leaving a good example for them. I believe that the role of a parent is to help their child enter the world and and be able to uh, to be self accountable and dependable and responsible for themselves. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, I believe that by me working hard and working to be a good person every day, even though we're not perfect, uh, I can lead by example to where the impact that I've had on them. Will have they'll have a greater impact on the rest of the world or in their own lives, hopefully by the example I'm helping set. So that's kind of cheesy, but you asked me on the spot, and for me, it's all about my family. I, I mean, of it. course, of course, it is. I love it, man. Cre creates a butterfly effect of change. I love it. That's right. That's right. Well, excellent. Thanks, guys and gals. Make sure that you subscribe to this this uh, podcast on iTunes. You'll find a link somewhere below this if you're looking at it on our website. Or head head over to carrotcast.com and please give us a rating and give us a, uh, give us a, a little you know click the subscription button and uh, we'd love the support spread it around and Brian have an amazing rest of the week and thanks for coming on man thank you.